morning. So today we are going to talk about nesting. And um, I'm excited about this because we're now delving into the realm of more complex experiments that are really kind of interesting. And um, you might kind of look at the designs we've talked about so far and ask, why haven't we gotten here to nested designs yet? And that's because um, Nesting adds a level of complication in terms of actually understanding the relationship among factors in your experiment. So I want to introduce you to nesting with um, an example. So let's say that we are interested in uh, growth of algae uh, in response to nitrogen. So, you know, this is a well-known biological problem. Um, fertilizers wash into streams, stimulate algal growth, and so forth. So, uh, and it might be phosphorus, just more interested in nitrogen. But anyway, we're going to examine nitrogen in this particular experiment. So we create two treatments, low nitrogen and high nitrogen. Of course, we could have more than two treatments. Uh, and we're going to, practice for practical reasons, we're going to grow the nitrogen in flasks, and we're going to um, grow these flasks in an incubator of some kind and uh, inoculate them with algae. Um, okay, so we have our algae growing in here in these flasks, little waves of water in here, and we've inoculated them with a known initial population size of algae. Okay, so we have algae growing down here and um, we're going to um, sample the algae. So we're going to take algae out of uh, the flasks and analyze uh, the algal population. But we know when we do this we have quite a bit of sampling error. So we want to maybe do it three times, for example. So we do times three per flask. Okay, we do that here we do that here, etc. We're going to get three samples out of each flask, and um, and so our sampling scheme uh, is such that we have uh, suddenly another factor involved here. So we have nitrogen level, and we have flask, and we have flasks one, two, three. And these are different flasks over here, obviously, because they have different nitrogen levels. Um, so this is our experimental setup. And um, we have replication within flask, which means we can test the flask effect. So let's look at this experimental design. Every design up until this point, we have had um, all possible combinations. So here we have low and high nitrogen. And now we have this other factor, flask. And we have six of them, six unique flasks. Okay, so let's look at our experimental design. This looks on the surface like a two-way experimental design, right? Uh, in fact, at the low level, right over here, flask one, we have n equals three samples that we've taken. Same here and same here. But, whoops, but uh, in flask four, um, we don't have anything. There's nothing there in flask four, five, and six at the low nitrogen level, and that's because flask four is only found at the high nitrogen level. Likewise, in flask one, we don't have the high nitrogen level, so this is missing data here, but we have an n equals three here in flask 4, 5, and 6 for the high nitrogen level. So what you see is when we try to draw this out as a two-way design, it doesn't actually work um, because we have missing cells. Okay, so lack of replication is going to make it impossible to analyze this uh, in a legitimate way. So um, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to restructure this understanding of the relationship among these variables. In fact, uh, if we look at it, 
we can see that each flask is unique to each treatment. That is, you know, flask one is only found in the low end treatment. Flask two is only found in the low end treatment, etc. So the term flask in our model, whoops, about that. The term flask in our model is unique to a particular N level. Now, um, it's important to, to look at that um, question. We've already asked, uh, is each flask found with each N level? And the answer to that question was no. And therefore, it's not factorial. We don't have every combination of the two. Um, but instead, flask is unique to a particular N level. Uh, is N level unique to each flask? No. Um, we have low end level in flask one, we have low end level in flask two, we have low end level in flask three. So the answer to that is no, but f is flask unique to a particular end level? The answer to that is yes. What this means is that flask is nested within end level. Okay? So flask is nested within a particular nitrogen level. Okay, um, I think maybe the best way to illustrate this is to give another example. So let's, let's use another example. And I think this is actually harking back to one I talked about in an earlier video, uh, where we have uh, a sampling problem. We want to uh, measure something about um, properties of individual leaves, like um, let's, let's say, for example, we want to understand chlorophyll content. And we want to get an estimate of the mean chlorophyll content of, say, maple. Okay, so we're going to um, we're going to uh, have to, and we, we're interested in this at a very broad level. So we're going to have to choose watersheds to sample. We may have multiple watersheds we want to sample. We're going to have to select trees within watersheds. Okay. And within those trees, we're going to have to select particular branches to sample. All right, and then within those branches, we're going to have to select particular leaves, leaves within the branches, within the trees, within the watersheds, right? And then um, we may even know that there's sampling error with that, and so we want multiple leaf punches uh, within a leaf, within a branch, within a tree, within a watershed. <laughs> okay? And now I'm starting to give you the notation of how this is going to work. Okay, so here's an example. So we might have a, watersheds A and B. We might have trees 1, 2, and 3 and four, five, and six. Notice I've given them different numbers there. That's on purpose. And then within those, we have perhaps two branches we've randomly selected. By the way, every step of the way here, we're selecting randomly from a population. And within those branches, we're going to select perhaps two uh, leaves. etc. Okay, and within the leaves we might take, for example, three leaf punches. One, two, three. I won't write all this out, etc. Okay, so you know the n at each level could be really multiplicative and start to get big. We have maybe two 
uh, watersheds. We have three trees per watershed. Uh, we have two branches per tree, and we have, um, oh, I've shown here two leaves uh, per branch, and we've had, uh, we got three punches per leaf, okay? So we now have a two by th times three times two times two times three. Uh, that's a lot of leaf punches here. So we have six times 12. Uh, 6 times 2 is 12, times 2 is 24, times 3 is, what, 70, uh, 72 punches. So you can see with nested designs, you can get up to very large sample size very quickly if you have a, a lot of levels of nesting. Okay, so this is another example of a nested design. And it's a matter of we're measuring something at the leaf level, but we want to extrapolate to a broad landscape. And so we have to make choices of the units within each watershed that we're going to sample in order to get down to that level of leaf punch. And at every level, we want those entities to be representative of the level above. And therefore, because we want to generalize all the way to across watersheds here in, in this particular case. So you can imagine there could be even more levels than this. <laughs> and the other thing is, I think, to think about is we're not really interested in each of these levels particularly. We might be interested in the fact that there is tree-to-tree -tree variation and branch-to-branch -branch variation and so forth, but we don't care about those particular branches and we don't care about those particular trees because we're generalizing about chlorophyll content of the species. Okay, at the highest level we may be interested, for example, we may choose these two watersheds to be different in some way that's particularly interesting. Perhaps one has been <clears throat> treated with lime and the other one hasn't, in which case that's a little bit different. So in my next video, I'm going to actually start talking about these contrasts between randomly chosen factors and factors that are chosen for a reason that has to do with what's called random and fixed effects. But the point I want to make now is that all of these levels down below the top level um, need to be randomly chosen if we're going to claim that the numbers we're getting at the very bottom, whatever we're measuring our y on, are representative and therefore we can extrapolate to those higher levels. Um, just as individuals need to be randomized, have always been randomized at the bottom level within our two-way and three-way designs. Okay, so uh, let's give another example. Example three Uh, we're interested in uh, maybe a toxicology or pharma pharmacology example. Okay, so we have a drug that we're testing out. Drug A, uh, we're comparing it to drugs B, C, and D, which might already be on the market, just as an example. And um, we're going to administer that drug to rats. And we would certainly want replicate rats that we administer these drugs to. Now, um, there are a lot of ways to design an experiment. For example, we could have the same rats exposed to all the drugs and at different times, and that could be a cross design, right? But if we had 12 different rats, and we had three rats per drug, by the way, when you draw it like this, you can sort of see it's a nested design because rat is unique to drug. Drug is not unique to rat because we've got three rats that have that drug. So rat is unique to drug. We don't have each rat found with each drug when we draw it this way. And then maybe we have to take, we know there's variation because of sampling variation. We have to take at least two blood samples to get a good idea of the mean for each rat. And actually when we construct SAS jump data sets about this, we'll want to use this procedure as well of numbering each sample uniquely because jump can make an error if you don't number each one uniquely. It doesn't know um, necessarily that these individuals are in fact different and that these samples are all different. So just to be sure that all these rats uh, are treated as individuals and you don't do the wrong analysis, you can label these 
uh, with different numbers. In other words, don't call rat four rat one, and this rat two and this rat three, because it could be that Jump would then interpret this rat as the same as this rat, but it's not. So we give it a different number, and then it can't possibly make that mistake. Okay, so this is a nested design, and when we're listing listing effects in our SAS Jump model, what we're going to do is actually start off with the top level. So we're interested in the drug effect, and we have rat nested within drug. I'll show you how to set that up. And then that's it. Sample is actually the error term. And of course, you don't put that in when you're specifying the model. That's obviously included. Um, and what's going to happen is that uh, with nesting designs, the level below is going to be used to test the level above for our F ratio. Now I'll get into the nitty gritty of um, the nitty gritty of nesting, and we'll do a sample calculation in the next video. But I wanted to just kind of point out that um, we have uh, nesting. Uh, this is sort of one level nesting here, <laughs> one level below the top level um, nesting, and. The previous example had several levels of nesting. Uh, the example before that with nitrogen and flask just had one level like this one too. Okay, so this is how nested designs are depicted. Um, I'm going to show you how to illustrate more complex designs with both crossing and nesting in a separate video. But for now, I've introduced you to simple nested designs. They can have different numbers of levels depending upon uh, how many factors you want to take into account in your choice of your ultimate experimental unit. Okie doke.